Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, just a new model for urban sustainability. And this is going to focus on something that, uh, that very often we have a very negative perception of. And this is, uh, we, can, we call it by different names. We call it wastewater. We call it sewage. We call it uh, uh, many, many different things. But what I'm going to present to you is, is the case and evidence and technologies to actually convert uh, many of these streams, sewage streams, waste streams, into, into products which are commercially very viable. And I'm going to also take you through some of the technologies that, uh, that we have developed in, in my lab in Colombia and, uh, and have taken it out into full scale, let's say, in the city of New York, in parts of Africa, and different parts of, uh, different parts of the US. And so uh, let's, let's start with just a very basic framework. I'm, I'm sure everybody, everyone, everyone here has seen uh, a list of challenges that we are facing today uh, and, and in the future. I'm sure you've seen this in one form or the other. And the, and the usual suspects are actually here. There's uh, shortage of energy, water, food, environment. There's poverty, terrorism. And, uh, and again, some of this is compounded by just the sheer number of people that we are faced with. I think we just hit the 7 billion mark. Uh, and and the, other, the other fact that compounds this is that the 7 billion people in the world are just not uniformly distributed. And uh, if you believe some articles that, that have come out recently, up to about 70% of the world's population will, will migrate and live in cities by, by 2050. And I think this is completely correct uh, because, of the, because of the forcing factors which, uh, which actually drive such localized migrations. So essentially, the, the bottom line is we just cannot hope to solve uh, these problems in isolation or individually. So there's no way we can, we can solve the energy crisis and not get, uh, get hit by water or food shortages. We tried this, remember, a couple of years ago. Everybody was growing corn to make ethanol. And what happened? The price of corn went up. People were going, growing, uh, going hungry. So this is, uh, again, if you, if you read literature, this is something that we can define as a wicked problem. Th these things cannot be solved in isolation. Uh, and we really have to take, uh, take a much, much, much better uh, or a holistic approach uh, or a more uh, 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 bigger approach to be able to solve, uh, solve these problems. And uh, at the heart of several of these problems lies the water cycle, lies water quality, because water quality links directly to environmental health and human health. And so the case I'm going to make today is uh, by, by, taking, by taking another look, by uh, by taking another look, let's say, at the water cycle, we can actually solve not only problems associated with water, but we can actually improve human dignity. We can, we can change the social status of people. Uh, we can actually turn waste processing facilities into biorefineries where we are just not mindlessly cleaning up a water stream. We're actually producing products that can be sold and monetized. And so, but, but, but uh, before we go there, let's, let's take a look at uh, sewage. Let's just take a literal, literally, let's take a look at sewage. This is what we see. Uh, and uh, this is what, of course, I'm not, I mean, there's no, there is no surprise that there are, uh, I, mean, I mean, this is something quite negative. Uh, just indiscriminate dumping of sewage into receiving water bodies, for example, has very negative impacts, not only on environmental health, but also directly human health as well. This is not a problem associated only with uh, underdeveloped or developing countries. I just thought I'd put a schematic of the Long Island Sound. This is where we are. This is the Lo Long Island Sound. And uh, this is a map of oxygen levels in the Long Island Sound uh, every summer. This is about 10 years ago. But the, but the message is consistent. At the end of the summer every year, there are vast regions of the Long Island Sound which are, which are severely hypoxic. Hypoxic meaning that the oxygen concentration in the sound is extremely low. What this means is we cannot go swimming, we cannot go fishing. Uh, there is no recreational use in the sound. And uh, this is all because of uh, the fact that sewage treated in some form or the other to some extent gets dumped into receiving water bodies. So this is not just restricted to the developing countries, it's, it's just everywhere. And so what do we do, uh, at least in the developed world, when we, when we are faced with the prospect of, uh, of cleaning up sewage? What we essentially do is uh, we develop very, very, very good technologies, very complicated, complex technologies to address sewage streams. And essentially, this is what we do. Uh, the sewage comes in, we take out all the, the particles, the, the coarse material, and then we send off the remaining materials to these bioreactors, bioreactor-based technologies. Uh, where we remove the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So I'm an engineer. When I look at, when I look at uh, uh, complicated problems, I try to break it down. One way to do this is break, down the break it down into elements. So for me, sewage is carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in different forms. And essentially what we do is we design 
implement and operate bioreactors to convert the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus into forms which are less benign, uh, which are more benign, less harmful to the uh, to the environment. For instance, with carbon. With organic carbon, we convert it to carbon dioxide. And, and believe me, wastewater plants don't contribute too much to the CO2 footprint. The nitrogen we convert to nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is benign. It's about 80% of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, and so on. And uh, what do we do next? We just, uh, we just send the water uh, further. We disinfect it. And then we discharge this into, into water bodies like the Hudson River or the Long Island Sound. This is how, this is how we treat uh, wastewater for the most part in the, in, in the US, in, uh, in the developed countries today. Uh, what is not shown very often is that uh, is the energy footprint, the cost footprint of treating wastewater. I'm not saying don't treat wastewater. It's, it's very important. But this, let's take another look at how we are doing this today. Essentially, this little bioreactor here, uh, let's say, let's come back to the city of New York. The size of the bioreactors as a whole is about, uh, is about the equivalent of uh, uh, 400 million gallons. The, the wastewater flow rate of New York City is 1.4 billion gallons per day. This is, this is the volume, this is the size uh, that we are dealing with. And uh, in order to, let's say, convert the carbon and nitrogen, what we have to supply to these reactors is huge amounts of air and oxygen. And uh, this, and without going into too much detail, 70% of the, of the energy use of the wastewater treatment plant uh, goes into this little reactor to make sure that we are oxidizing the carbon, converting the nitrogen, and so on. And there are, uh, there's also a high energy cost, there's a high uh, chemical cost, and so on. So this is very resource intensive, this is extremely energy intensive. We can do this in the developed world, this is fine, and this is why we are doing it in this form today. Just, again, just to provide you all with a very quantitative perspective, how much do we pay for sanitation? If you look at the, if you look at bills, uh, we, pay, we, we don't pay too much for sanitation. Uh, reference to uh, drinking to, for bottled water, we pay a lot more for, uh, for bottled water than we do for sanitation. Uh, how much does it cost for wastewater treatment, for instance? It costs a lot more than what we actually pay, but again, it's, uh, it's about a dollar per gallon. This is not, uh, this is not, this is not that much. Uh, we pay incrementally more for removing nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. This is not what, what, uh, what renders this process uh, infeasible and impractical in the developing countries. This is the reason why. We are spending 500 to 2500 kilowatt hour per million gallons for treating sewage in the US. Uh, for the city of New York, just to give you a reference again, this is 17 to 85 megawatts per day uh, that we have to spend. This is what renders the way we are treating wastewater in the developed countries, this is what renders this completely impractical to do this in a place like, uh, like Af in parts of Africa, parts of South America, and, and parts of Asia also. Uh, so I'll, 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 just to paint a better picture, uh, there have been wastewater treatment plants designed and built uh, all over the world. So I'll give you an example of Accra, Ghana, a city that I've been visiting more and more these days. Uh, so we went to uh, a very high-tech, very advanced wastewater treatment plant sitting in the middle of the city uh, in Accra. Uh, there is a very, very nice infrastructure in place in the city of Accra where the fecal sludge, where the waste is actually collected in trucks. There's a centralized distribution system where the waste is then channeled to all these uh, nice advanced wastewater treatment plants. What is the flow going into these wastewater treatment plants today in Accra? Any guesses? City of New York, 1.4 billion gallons. City of Accra going into wastewater plant, zero. Because somewhere along the way, the truck drivers figure out, well, they are paid by, they are paid by the volume, how many truckloads they deliver uh, of fecal sludge that they deliver. So then they realized, why, why, just, why just be stuck uh, at one point? Let's just take the fecal sludge, dump it into, uh, in the ocean, we'll get paid the same, and the wastewater plants uh, are just sitting there. This is, this is something I saw. If you climb up to the top of the digester, uh, the wastewater plant, there is no waste being processed. It's a very nice plant, very clean. Across, if you, if you look across to the ocean, there will be a line of trucks waiting to dump the sewage into the, into the ocean. So this is what happens. There is, there is very little energy, uh, and this is really what breaks, uh, w this is why the system really breaks down. So this is the way, if we continue to look at waste, if we continue to look at sewage as something that we have to devote energy and resources for cleaning and removing pollutants, this is where, we'll, this is where we will get stuck. On the other hand, let's, let's maybe look at this a slightly different way. Let's ask the question, how much chemical energy is embedded in, uh, in wastewater and sewage? Uh, this is about, 
80 to 160 megawatts per day for the city of New York. This is a multiple of what we are actually spending treating this. Why are we doing this? Uh, well, I don't have a good answer. Uh, there's additionally thermal and flow energy, which is also embedded in the, in the sewage flow. I'm telling you 1.4 billion gallons of water per day. How much energy can we just recover from the flow uh, that, that, that's going through? A lot. And then finally, there are also other elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, of course, but there is potassium, there, is, uh, there, there are other metals which can be recovered. And, uh, and, the, and the box we have to put in the middle is the technology to be able to, ans to ask a different question and actually answer, these, uh, answer this question as well. So now let's go back to the same wastewater treatment plant and ask the question, is it possible to save energy and recover energy actually and recover resources when we are treating uh, sewage or fecal sludge? And uh, let's be a little more ambitious and let's ask the question, can we actually make chemicals out of this? And so now at this point, we're not talking about waste treatment at all. We are talking about taking a very rich carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus stream and converting this system into not a plant that just sits idle, but we are now converting this into a biorefinery because now the substrates are now going into all kinds of different chemicals which can be sold. And this is not a pipe dream. This is, this is something I do in the lab all the time with, uh, with my students, and I, I'll have a few examples to show you as well. Well, here they are. So what are the different types of chemicals that we can recover? And this is just a tiny, this is really the tip of the iceberg here. We can go to biofuels. We don't have to go to ethanol. We don't have to restrict ourselves to ethanol, methanol, all kinds of biofuels. We make precursors for biograd and smart soils in my lab. We make commercial chemicals in my lab. We make precursors for bioplastics in my lab. We make biofertilizers from food waste in my lab. This is something that we don't do because the strength of the wastewater is simply not there. There are other approaches to make electricity from waste as well, but I'm not going to go into that today. So let, let's go into some example. Again, let's take the model carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. I'm going to give you a few examples for recovering carbon, uh, then nitrogen, and, uh, then phosphorus, maybe not nitrogen. Uh, so this is one of the first projects I worked for for the city of New York almost 10 years ago. And what we did was uh, we took sewage sludge and converted the sewage sludge into uh, into chemicals that the, that the city of New York usually spends about $15 million every year uh, in trying to, uh, well, they purchase these chemicals and then they dump them into their wastewater plants. What we said was, hey, let's take the sludge and make these chemicals ourselves. We made this. The limiting factor was the amount of sewage that we could process. The bioreactors, these are bioreactors that we designed and we ran for, for almost a decade. And uh, the limiting factor was not the conversion efficiency of this process, but the amount of sewage that we actually got. We were, we were limited by just the waste that we got. And we saved, on average, uh, we saved $15 million for the city of New York every year. I'm extending, extending some of these processes into, into Africa. One of, the, one of the projects I have, which is supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is conversion of sewage sludge, fecal sludge rather, to biofuels, including biodiesel, and methanol, this is uh, the ground. The groundbreaking for this uh, uh, process is actually going on right now. And uh, by the spring semester, we, we will have uh, this, this biorefinery actually running in, uh, in Accra. One of the highlights is that uh, we are actually taking some of the digester biogas, which has again been practiced for centuries. Uh, we are taking this biogas, and instead of just uh, using this to uh, fuel burners or stoves, we're actually converting this into a liquid fuel that, uh, that, that, that you can use for many, many more applications. Uh, again, these are just a very, very, uh, a very small subset of, of the compounds, but I also wanted to show you a list of chemicals which, uh, which we can potentially harvest from, uh, from, uh, from waste and sewage. Well, you can take a look at, at the chemical names, of course, but let's take a look at the price. Ethanol doesn't even compare. Gasoline doesn't even compare. We are talking $10, uh, $10 a gallon for compounds like succinic acid, which, which we can produce. Compounds like ethyl acetate, methyl acetate, this is nothing glamorous, you know? But it costs a lot more, uh, uh, it costs a lot more than just, uh, just making ethanol. And uh, just, just to tell you, the, uh, just to kind of mention the ease, at, ease with which we can measure, uh, synthesize these chemicals, Ethanol acetate, methanol acetate, we can, do this in the, we can do this in our sleep. Rather, the bugs in the reactor can do this while I sleep. So a lot of this can be recovered fairly, fairly uh, straightforward fashion. Uh, but this is not trivial. We still need to figure out how to separate these chemicals. But, uh, but of course, this is not a deal breaker. We actually work on this now to actually harvest these chemicals as well. 
Uh, phosphorus uh, recovery is also very important. Again, we are talking carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. If you believe some of the accounts that uh, in literature, we are probably going to run out of, run out of phosphorus before we run out of uh, petroleum. And so recovery of phosphorus is, is pretty important. And uh, there's, a, there's a company uh, called Ostara, which does this on a commercial scale. They go into wastewater treatment plants, and they sell the wastewater treatment plants their technology to be able to recover the phosphorus. And the company then sells the phosphorus, and they make even more money. So this is a big market, actually. Uh, this is all great. We thought, uh, well, why get caught up in all this? Uh, why get caught up at Ostara? Let's just take food waste from the Carlton Cafeteria on the fourth floor of mud. We just took the waste up to the ninth floor of mud. We fermented it, and we gave it to some brave undergraduate students in our department, and they grew some uh, plants and vegetables with it. And uh, of course, this all works. This is why I'm presenting it. But uh, what I'd like to highlight is, let's say, this is uh, just compost that you can buy or you can make. And this is the result from our fermentation uh, reactor. And essentially, the bottom line is, we are engineers. We can develop technologies. We know how to do this. But we can also fine tune these technologies to be able to achieve the desired nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, as you see in, in something that you buy in a, in a shop. And there, uh, to make these fertilizers, we are not paying. We are actually taking food waste for which we get paid. And then we are actually converting this into, uh, into something that we can sell. So this is a this is huge positive uh, cash flow potentially. OK, now the beauty of all of this is we don't need to build wastewater treatment plants in the middle of a country where no one is going to use this. This can be done, resource recovery, recovery of uh, waste, recovery of resources, recovery of chemicals, biorefining, can be done in the basement of a building. It can be done on the ninth floor of mud. It can be done in the basement of a brownstone in Harlem. Uh, and literally anywhere. It can also be done in the, in the basement of a, of, a, of a building in Battery Park. Uh, what they are doing in the solar building in Battery Park is that they are recovering water. They are reusing, uh, recovering water and reusing water. We, of course, we can go many, many steps further and recover not only water, but we can actually recover chemicals. Uh, and in fact, some of the new developments in Midtown Manhattan are already considering recovering food waste, but then recovering this into, into, into fuels uh, to maybe power some, some lights in the basement, in the apartment, and so on. So this is, this is very close. Uh, this is actually reality today. Uh, one of the challenges when we are talking about a, about a building, well, one of the positive aspects when you're talking about a building like this is that uh, the, the, the population size is there, the concentration, the population density is there, so we can just build the reactors to address uh, the waste coming from so many people. We can't do this for a single person. We need uh, some, some minimum number of people. Uh, the, the challenge is that uh, when we are talking about human waste, essentially the model that we have today is we have human waste and we use water to flush it away. We use water as a medium to carry the waste away. And this is simply not going to, uh, to work when we are talking about resource recovery. How did we address the challenge? Essentially, what we came up with are source separation toilets. And I'll explain to you what source separation is in just a second. Uh, we basically have latrines and toilets that we have designed. I'm very fortunate to have worked with a very talented bunch of students uh, as part of my Engineers Without Borders uh, project. Uh, and essentially what we do is we design source separation latrines and toilets. Essentially what these toilets do is that they separate the liquid waste and the human waste exactly the way that the body produces it. And instead of combining them, we deal with them on an independent basis. In a healthy individual, the liquid waste is supposed to be sterile. And so this can, and, and this is the way, this is the stream that has all the nitrogen and phosphorus, most of the nitrogen and phosphorus. So you can directly take it for chemical processing or direct application as fertilizer. The organic carbon, which contains the pathogens, can be subjected to, uh, let's say, bioprocessing, biorefining, and uh, we can make energy out of this as well. Now, the other highlight is that none of these processes require any air. Remember the 70% energy going into that little bioreactor, we have completely done away with this now. We don't require all that energy to, uh, to, to process the organics. So uh, today we use the word wastewater, fecal sludge, sewage, very negative. One day this is all going to change. Uh, already in the field that I'm in, we've almost stopped using the word wastewater. We just call this sewage. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot of propaganda about war over water. I don't think this is ever going to happen. We are engineers, we are technologists. If we ever go to war over water, there will be much, much more serious problems that would have preceded this war, this so-called war over water that we're going to have. Very simply, because in, embedded in each of these waste streams, waste streams, I'm still using the word, there is water. 
And uh, converting sewage into drinking water is, again, not a dream. Look at what is happening in Singapore. This is, uh, this is the concept of new water. Essentially, they take sewage, they refine it, they produce new water. And of course, what we are adding uh, from a technological perspective is that we are not only recovering water, but we are recovering phosphorus, carbon, nitrogen, and everything else to go along with it. Now, I'm an engineer, I develop technologies, and I also like to make a lot of money with these technologies. And so one of the benefits, and I think you should too, and, uh, and one of the benefits of doing this uh, is, is, is as follows. So this is, let's say, a typical wastewater plant. Let's say we are, we are removing nitrogen, carbon, and, and so on. One of, the, one of the key findings from one of my projects last year was that if you remove or if you convert uh, let's say nitrogen ascent from the from the liquid phase. What we are also doing is we are minimizing the the, the formation and emission of greenhouse gases such as nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas which is about 300 times as bad as CO2. And uh, what happens when you emit less N2O? You can you can trade this on the Chicago Climate Exchange. All you have to do is multiply the N2O number by a factor of 300, and you'll get a lot more money for it. And what do you do with all the money? You can, the, you can uh, improve the technology that you put in place. And th th this is the study that we published in conjunction with the Environmental Defense Fund just earlier this year. So I think I've uh, conveyed the positive aspects, but I, I would also like to caution, again, from a very practical engineering perspective, resource recovery is great, but this doesn't solve every all the problems all over the world. And so again, instead of mindlessly adopting resource recovery all over the world in a consistent fashion, we have to kind of be savvy enough and see where what applies. And uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Uh, I just arbitrarily divided the world into different uh, groups here. We have the G8 or G20, I don't know the number anymore, uh, the, developed, the developed countries. Uh, and then we have the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China. And then we have uh, uh, the developing countries. This is just the theme. Just don't get caught up in the, in the countries themselves. So let's, let's, take a dif let's take a look at the differences that exist uh, among these groups and see where we can apply resource recovery technology and to what extent. So let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at uh, the developed countries and let's see what, what, what these are characterized by. So there is enough food security most, for the most part in the developed countries. People are not, frankly, they're not dying of hunger here uh, because we don't have fertilizer. We have lots of fertilizer, nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, the other aspect here is we have very good technology and engineering know-how. So if there are technologies coming up, uh, chances are there will be people who will be very knowledgeable in how to implement and run these technologies. There will not be a wastewater treatment plant sitting in the middle of Manhattan not running. People will go to jail before that. Uh, so here what we can actually do is uh, we can focus on car so again, coming back to sewage, there's carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. Uh, we should recover phosphorus in any case, and I think we, we need to do that, just, 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 uh, just to make sure we don't run out of phosphorus. Uh, let's see what the other components are. There's carbon. There is enough technology uh, and engineering know-how in, in the developed world that we can actually take the sewage streams and convert them into, uh, into biofuels. That is there. Do we need to recover the nitrogen in the developed countries? Maybe not right now. We, we can, we can kind of uh, look beyond and uh, just focus on carbon and carbon and phosphorus. Uh, let's go to the other end of the spectrum now, uh, the, the underdeveloped countries or the developing countries. There are big questions on food security. People just don't have enough to eat because there are, there is, they are limited by the amount of fertilizer that they, that they produce. Technology and engineering, education, there are, there are, there are questions. This is not really the, the strongest point. In this case, do we really need to recover the carbon? Perhaps not. Let's put food on the plate first. Let's, let's recover the nitrogen and phosphorus first, feed the people, and then we can consider carbon. Now let's look at, uh, let's look at this group in the middle, the BRIC nations, and just using this as a model. Uh, there are some questions on food security, maybe not as bad, maybe not as good. On the other hand, what they have as a big asset is technology and engineering education. I mean, look at some of the immigrants in this room who have, who have, done, uh, who have completed part of their education in some of these countries. Here, of course, we have to recover the phosphorus. Of course, we need to recover nitrogen to, to provide food. But let's go ahead and implement technologies where we can actually also recover, recover carbon. So I think we need to look at models like these before we completely go and uh, turn, up, turn the infrastructure uh, around in countries. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. We do things in the US for a certain reason because things work. Uh, and we just should not go blindly and, and uh, just uproot everything. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you very much.